Mr. Mark Durkin has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Health. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should rise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. I will call the clerk to read the question. To ask the Minister of Health what action she will take to address the unfolding crisis in mental health waiting times in every health and social care trust across Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call the Minister of Health. I'm grateful for the opportunity to address this important issue today. We have a higher than average prevalence of mental health issues compared with other regions, and it's, uh, it's that, together with increased awareness of psychological therapies and a legacy of unmet need, which, is, which have contributed to increased waiting times. I have said consistently since I was appointed that mental health is one of my key priorities, and I've been working hard to identify the needs and the gaps in services that need to be addressed, and also to formulate a plan for action. The draft delivery plan for the Programme for Government Improving Mental Health Indicator is out to consultation next month or until next month, and it recognises that psychological therapies is an area that needs further investment together with a wide range of specialist services such as perinatal mental health. It currently envisages that it will take five years at the very least to start to see an appreciable movement in mental health on a population level. A 10-year programme is probably more realistic. I have adopted six principles to improve mental health with a first step of committing to a move towards parity of esteem to ensure, that the mental health receive, to ensure that mental health receives the time, effort and resources required to meet local needs. Of the 10 million that is currently invested in psychological therapies, around 2 million is invested in the development of primary care talking therapy hubs. I acknowledge that a further 3 million is needed to complete this programme. At the moment, nine hubs are operational across the region, providing treatment and care at a community level to over 7,000 people. A further five hubs are in development. Recovery colleges have also been established in each trust area, and I also, for example, allocated 180,000 earlier this year to continue the development of a comprehensive mental trauma service, which is based on the psychological therapies step care model, and when fully established, will employ over 40 specialist staff. Clearly, we face a challenging budgetary situation, and whilst I'm actively making the case for more money for mental health, it is incumbent on us all to get the best value for money, which we've already spent, which is why the Board is working up proposals for a managed care network to better utilise existing expertise across trusts and to promote uniformity and better continuity of care. This, is also, this also demonstrates why fundamental reshaping of the health and social care service is so vital to enable money to be released across the system so that it can be targeted to those areas that need it most. I am fully aware of the significant challenges that face us with regard to mental health. I am committed to improving services. This will be a long-term effort, and given the current budgetary position, there will be a need to prioritise. It's also important to note that even if all the money required right across mental health services was immediately available, there would be a delay in utilising it fully, given the need to recruit highly skilled staff. Call Mr. Durkin for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for her answer. But given that health service authorities are now saying that they need about 160 additional staff to deal with mental health pressures. What action, and we have heard much from the Minister on how she will prioritise mental health, but what action has she taken to recruit staff in this area and to support external organisations, many of them unfunded, who provide services and support to people in their darkest hours? I'm going to can call you and just to pick up on the last point first in relation to external organisations and I'm assuming you're referring, for example, the community voluntary sector. Earlier today, um, I had a meeting with the Neve Louise Foundation, an organisation which I'm sure the member is aware of, who are providing excellent services in the community and quite often they would describe themselves as first aiders in relation to mental health and dealing with people who feel suicidal. I think that we have to continue and enhance the role that we have across government but also with the community and voluntary sector to successfully tackle mental health issues in our society. I think that we have, uh, I have a number of issues which I need to tackle, and I suppose a number of factors that point to the, the, the current state of play, particularly the fact that we have a legacy and underinvestment in our mental health services, which is something which we need to address over time and is going to be particularly challenging given the budgetary um, issues which we have to deal with. We have an increase in the demand for our services. We have a recognition that the use of psychological therapies are an excellent way to support people. So that means that more people are aware about psychological therapies and more people are requesting them and being referred for them. 
That's a good thing. But I think that we need to, and clearly the board have set out their stall in relation to the challenges which we have in recruiting staff, which is not just symptomatic of issues in, the, in mental health. It's actually right across health and social care. So all those factors have, have led to a situation where we certainly have a long way to go in relation to improving mental health services. I said it's a priority for me in terms of an issue which I want to champion and run with. I think that at this moment in time, I have just in the last week received the evaluation of the Bamford Review. And the evaluation of the Bamford Review has um, been a look back in the last 10 years about how the executive, all government departments have actually worked to improve um, services for people with mental health problems. It's pointed to a number of gaps in services and it's pointed to where we need to do better. So I'm going to use that piece of work. I think we've had the, the recent work which the Royal College of Psychiatrists commissioned in the Lord Crisp Review. When you bring all those things together, we've got a real body of evidence now which points to what we need to do differently. So I intend to set out, um, as I said, and, and very much in line with the Programme for Government Indicator, how we're going to transform mental health services in the years ahead. And we'll have to do it incrementally, and I think that we can do that. But I think um, we have a lot of good things. I always say we have a lot of good things that happen in the health service, but we have an awful lot of way to go in terms of challenging where we need to do things better. But I think that we can. We have the information, the evidence that allows us to support a case um, to be able to transform mental health services in the future. Call Ms Paula Bradley. Can I thank the Minister for her answers thus far and also Mr Durkin um, for tabling the, the Sergeant Doyle today. Just to follow on from something he asked and do with the community and voluntary sector again, I attended um, the Greater Shankill Suicide and Self-Harm Reference Group in the Hammer Community Centre in the Greater Shankill area and they were talking about their local community response plan, which works very well when someone presents at ET who has actually committed suicide. So the response plan goes in, looks after the community, looks after the family uh, and builds up a, 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 a report poor with that. But what they had suggested was that maybe our ED departments need to look at this slightly differently, given the fact that this report states today that over six, or nearly 16,500 presented at ED departments and some more than one admission. So maybe we need to look at our ED departments as well and see if referrals can be made to those local community response uh, teams which are doing such invaluable work within their community and it's not just there to pick up the pieces after suicide but to assist in stopping people committing suicide. I think that's exactly the approach which we need to adopt. I think that um, quite often um, a lot of people will not even present to their EDs. They'll actually go to who they know is the local community group that's involved in supporting people with mental health problems. Um, very similar experience to yourself in relation to the work, uh, understanding the work that they do. So I think there certainly is a role for the community and voluntary sector. Um, I think that in terms of shaping our services, we obviously just finished the consultation on the Protect Life strategy, so the suicide strategy, and one of the things that's very strong in all of that is the need to work with the community and voluntary sector. So I'm very open to how we can strengthen how, the, how things happen, um, I think that, and how, how we interact with statutory and community and voluntary sector. Um, they have a role to play. None of us have, I always say this, nobody has the option now of working in silos. We all have to work together. And if we're all serious about delivering better outcomes for people with mental health, then um, I know certainly that the community voluntary sector are up for that. In relation to EDs, we should always keep that under review. If you remember a number of years ago, after a campaign from families who had been bereaved, the card before you leave system was brought into play. So there's simple things that can make a real difference. It was a lifeline to, to, to some families. So I think that we need to do more of those type of things. But I think the only way we're going to learn about those things is actually talking to service users, those people with um, lived experience who've actually came through uh, needing support in, in the health service. So I think we have a lot of lessons to learn, but the review of Bamford, um, the evaluation work that's been done, points to all the gaps that are there. And I think that um, I, well, I want to work with the health committee and all members of the house in relation to how we can put in place plans to actually improve the, the piece. But I think very clearly, whilst the programme for government um, indicator talks about a five-year plan, the feedback I'm getting from health professionals and from people who work in the thing is that we probably need to look it's very similar to the delivering together. We need to chart a way forward for the next 10 years, which will actually start to improve things. Well, Mr. Robbie Butler. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you, Minister, uh, for attending today. Uh, Minister, the largest share in breaches of psychological therapy services over recent months was recorded in my own trust, the South Eastern. In August, for instance, the South Eastern accounted for 773 of the 1,798 patients who were forced to wait longer than 13 weeks. Can the Minister detail specifically what steps she has taken to close the widening gap of unmet need and funding for psychological therapies in my constituency? Well, no, I won't get into, in the course of this debate right now, I won't get into the specifics in relation to the South Eastern Trust, but I'm very happy for the Trust to pick that up with the member directly, just in relation to what they're doing operationally. But the same things that I've just said actually stand for every Trust. We have to get to the point where, no matter where you live, 
in the north that you get the same access to services. It's unfortunate that in this moment in time, depending on where you live, you may have better access to psychological therapies, and that's what we're talking about today. So that's not acceptable to me. We need to have a regional standard. We need to make sure that no matter where you live, you have that full access. We have a psychological um, th strategy in place. Clearly, there's a recognition that psychological therapies work. They actually take pressure off the acute end of, of the mental health services. They're actually first aiding people. They're talking to people from, from very early on and maybe prevent them from having to actually um, move through um, the further ends of the health service. So we need to do more of this. I recognise that and I'm actively engaged in conversations with the finance minister in how we can actually fund psychological therapies in the, in the future. I, I believe in them. I believe that they're the right thing to do. I believe that they work and I think that in terms of doing more, we have to do more. Um, we, we have a certain level of investment which has been very positive but we certainly have a long way to go in terms of um, improving the picture for absolutely everybody who may need psychological therapies. Well, Ms Catherine Seeley. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for being here to discuss this important issue. Can I ask the Minister what consideration she has given to the principles that will inform her plans for tackling mental ill health? Yes, as I said, I think that um, we're in an opportune time, if you like, in that um, we have the review of the Bomford evaluation. But I think that, firstly and first and foremost, the commitment has to be about moving towards party of esteem. And I've said that I'm firmly committed to moving towards party of esteem. Secondly, I think it's really, really important that we develop a culture of and sustain a recovery culture. Whenever I talked in the last number of weeks about how we're going to transform health and social care, one of the things that we talked about was co-designing services and planning services along with patients and carers and families. Mental health, this is an area where actually mental health is already ahead of the field, in the field if you like. Uh, recovery colleges have been established and there are really, really practical examples of how people with lived experience, people who've had mental health problems, have actually helped to design services and improved and worked with, with others who find themselves in the same scenario. They've actually been employed then by trusts actually to, to, to provide those services. So I want to do a lot more of that in, in um, pursuing and enhancing the recovery culture which we have. Thirdly, involvement, as I said, by people with lived experience is so, so key. And the fourth principle is around service development where our resources allow us. So, we're going to have to prioritise. We don't have an unlimited pot of money. We're going to have to prioritise services and, and what we take forward. So let's make sure that every service that we, we, that we invest in is about delivering better health outcomes and is making a, a meaningful difference. So over the time ahead, we're going to have decisions to make to, to plug the gaps and the needs that are there in service provision. But the Bamford review is actually really, really key in terms of pointing out some of the areas where we need to do more. I'm particularly interested in making sure we do more around supporting young people, particularly young people with dual diagnosis. I want to do more in relation to establishing a regional perinatal service uh, for people with mental illness. I want to do more around eating disorder services. I want to do more around psychological therapies, mental trauma, personality disorders. There is so many things that are really, really key and really, really important, which we need to do. But I think that we have to come at it from a planned system change point of view, and that's going to take us a bit of time to do. But I think that what's most important is that we collectively work together, community and voluntary sector, government work together to make sure that we provide first-class services for those people when they need them. I said that um, waiting lists are always unacceptable. The length of some people are waiting for services right across health and social care is totally unacceptable to me. That continues to be the case. And we need to, um, whenever I publish the plan for how I'm going to bring elective care uh, under control in January, I look forward to, to discussing that with members of the House in relation to how we can actually improve that picture. Well, Ms Sinead Bradley. Um, well, the, the question today rightly looks at the out-and-out -out failure of meeting the 13-week target. I would like to express to the Minister my shock at finding out that anybody living with a mental health issue would have to wait 13 weeks, let alone that the target's not been met. Is the Minister satisfied that even that is an acceptable target? Well, well I wasn't shocked. And I don't think the members should be shocked. We've all known that there's a legacy and under, underinvestment in mental health services. So I don't know, um, I don't know how aware you are of mental health services and how they're, they're delivered. But certainly, it's no shock to me that there's a waiting list. There's no shock to me that we need to invest more in mental health services. It's no shock to me that we need to invest in all those areas which I just um, highlighted, areas where we need to do more. So I think that um, we have a very challenging um, situation for the. And I said it at the, the first answer which I gave: legacy of underinvestment increased demand for services, psychological therapies are working so people want them and rightly so. So we have big, big demand in our service and we need to deliver for, for those people that need our service. So don't be shocked but be assured 
that I'm doing everything that I can to make sure that we do change the services that we do provide. I'm doing everything I can, along with executive colleagues, with the Finance Minister, to make sure that we do deliver the funding that we need to invest in psychological therapies. Well, Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Um, speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your um, answer so far. Um, I welcome the praise you've given to the community and voluntary sector in dealing with this issue, and also your commitment to review mental health, psychological and therapeutic support services. And, and as part of that review, you'll find that there is no counselling and support for people who are under 16 who are the victims of um, sexual crime. So I, I, I would really welcome if you could be looking in that in terms of your review. Um, Th those organisations that plug those gaps where there isn't um, provision are very much reliant on core revenue funding, which comes from your department. And, and as, you, as you know, they have been having a year-on-year -year increase. Um, so I would ask you maybe to look at bringing forward the Innovation Fund as quickly as possible so that we don't lose these vital community and voluntary sector services that are so vital for this mental health issue. I thank the member for, um, for a question. And in relation to sexual crime and the services that are there, I don't have a full understanding of that, but I'll certainly look into it and make sure that that's um, included in terms of the, how, how we do take things forward. In relation to core funding, you're absolutely right. Some of the community voluntary sector do excellent work that the health service um, ha has been given some core funding for in the past, probably nowhere near what it takes for them to run the services. If the health service tried to do it themselves, they'd find themselves you know, really, really stretched to the limit. So I think that um, we have to recognise the excellent work that's out there in the community and voluntary sector. Um, the previous minister obviously decided to end core funding and, and to develop an innovation scheme. Um, I'm still um, looking at that because I think that I wanted to take a fresh look in relation to the organisations that we fund, some organisations which may disappear, and I would be fearful, particularly in relation to advocacy, how those groups would be supported in the future. So um, I'm currently considering that. I do want to get the innovation fund out the door because I know people are very anxious just because they have had the decrease in their funding over the last number of, of weeks. So I intend to at least... Uh, initiate the applications for the Innovation Fund before the end of the financial year to allow people to, 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 to bid in. But I'm also alongside that looking at is there any other potential or any other scope to support the community voluntary sector and particular groups which we need because we know the value which they bring to, to all those people that use their services. Well, Mr Jerry Carroll. Speaker, and given the, that according to the Health and Social Care Board, an additional £17 million will be needed to keep up with demand in mental health services, will the Minister give a guarantee that this money will be found, and if so, from where? Well, I think I've answered that um, I'm doing absolutely everything I can to, um, to work with the Finance Minister and to work with executive colleagues in relation to um, making sure that we have proper funding for our mental health services. It's not without its challenges, Tory austerity, I could list all the issues which we're having to deal with, so we don't have an unlimited pot of funding. But what we do have is a commitment to party of esteem. We have a legacy of underfunding in mental health. I want to change that picture and I'm committed to doing that. So I will work with executive colleagues throughout the budget process as, and I will not be found wanting in terms of shouting and fighting very hard to make sure that we have an adequate budget for health and social care in general, but in particular in this case today, in relation to being able to address the issues which we have in relation to psychological therapy itself. Well, Mr Gary Middleton. Mr Speaker, can I thank the Minister for her answer so far? Uh, the Minister will be aware that there has been an increase in the number of children and young people uh, presenting with mental health um, issues, as many as one in nine. Uh, will the Minister look at what specialist services, I know she touched on um, eating disorders and addressing that, uh, what specialist services are being provided to help address this worrying trend? Um, child and CAMS, as they're known, are um, delivered under a stepped care model, and the, the board itself leads in a reform process and under the, the auspices of the stepped care model implementation review. So I think there's been a lot of progress made there, but you're right, we've had more young people referred into our services, so we have to be always adapting to the needs of society. So if we have more younger people coming in, then we need more emphasis on CAMS. So I, I'm very, um, very committed to making sure we do that. We have investment now in CAMS of over 20 million annually, so I think that shows that there's a recognition that we need to, to put the funding there to, to support those young people. But I'm also considering um, reform and investment, investment options across a range of other services, including the CAM services, but also, as I said, I think it's important that we look at children, young people with dual diagnosis, for example, and um, I think that we don't have a service there for, for, for to support those families and that, that, that to me is something that we need to perhaps look at. If we can't do it here then let's look at it on an all island basis. Is it something that we can provide in this island? Um, particularly I, I, I just think that it's so important that young people 
know that their services are there to support them and they don't feel that they have nowhere to go. So I, I'm very keen to make sure we do that. There are also the regional acute inpatient services at Beechcroft are frequently under pressure and I think members are aware of that. And an independent review in 2014 concluded that the current 33 bed model is appropriate but crucially that this is dependent on the further strengthening of the crisis resolution and the home treatment services. So what else can we put into the community that actually stops people from having to go into acute inpatient settings I think is an area where we need to focus on. I just think that um, there's also just to say there's a managed care network for acute child and adolescent mental health services being established as we speak and that's going to bring acute services into one managed system and again will ensure greater consistency across the region and streamline access to Beechcroft. So I think again an area where we have to do an awful lot more but the Bamford evaluation actually points to these issues and points to the service gaps that we have and points to where we need to do a lot more. So this is certainly one of those key areas. Well, Mr Ian Mill. Thank you and thank the Minister for answers. And can I ask the Minister for an update on the suicide prevention strategy for a moment? Um, well, the consultation is closed. However, I still have a number of, um, I want to go out and engage personally, I've said. So I've met a number of organisations and individuals in relation to the, the strategy. Um, I intend to go out actually next week. I'm doing a consultation event in Belfast and I'm going to do one actually um, on, in Dungannon area as well. I just think it's important that I'm listening to, to people who've been bereaved by suicide and making sure that I'm developing a strategy which has very much got um, those people who've been bereaved views and, and, and ideas and initiatives uh, embedded in, in the strategy and going forward. So um, we're, we're going to be working, for that, working on that over the next um, number of months and collating all the responses which we've received. And as I said, I think it's really, really important that we listen to those people with lived experience. Well, Mr David Ford. Mr Speaker, uh, as I remember questioning the Minister's predecessor, Barbara de Bruyne, about 14 or 15 years ago about funding for mental, capacity, or mental health services, it's rather sad that Mr Durkin had to ask a question today to illustrate the problem. But given that the Minister has referred a few times to the Bamford Review, could she give us any information on the commencement of the Mental Capacity Act? Well, surely the member's not blaming Barbara de Bruyne for all the issues which we have in relation to mental health in our society. Um, we're a society coming out of conflict. Which is, which is one issue in, in itself. But we obviously have a prevalence issue which is continuing to rise in relation to young people and mental health issues, more people being referred into the service. So we have a societal problem. I don't think we can pinpoint it on any one area. We have a societal problem which we need to address. We need to address it right across every government department, every council, every community and voluntary sector that wants to get involved. Do people have access to a job? Do they have a home? All those things all contribute to people's mental well-being. So we have a collective responsibility, I believe, um, as, as an executive and a society to actually help people who find themselves with mental health issues. In relation to the, um, the legislation, the member will be very aware that it's a very complex piece of legislation and we're working our way through all of the issues as we speak. Officials in my department and DOJ are working through um, all the initiative because we need, whenever we enact the bill, we need to make sure that we can deliver on it. So um, the member will in his previous role as Minister, is, is very aware of the challenges which we have in relation to Mental Capacity Bill. It was a significant piece of legislation, so I think it's important that we have everything lined up and we can deliver everything that we say whenever we, whenever we actually enact the legislation. Members, that concludes this item of business. I ask the members to take their raise while we change the top table. <laughs>